become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm James Fallows, National Correspondent for The Atlantic, and I am delighted to be the moderator for today's program. This program is part of the Commonwealth Club's Good Lit series, underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. The Commonwealth Club has, of course, shifted from in-person programs to virtual events, and the club is grateful for the support of all of you, our viewers. We appreciate your considering donating to the club by clicking on the blue donate button at the top of the YouTube chat box or visiting the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. We're going to discuss um, U.S.-China relations through a number of lenses, including those of his recently published book, uh, his first novel, My Old Home, A Novel of Exile, a sweeping journey that takes us from the rise of Mao Zedong in 1949 to the Tiananmen Square uprising in 1989. Orville's novel illustrates many fault lines in life, including between the U.S. and China and within China. And we'll also be honored and pleased to get the additional perspective of Ambassador Lord, who's worked closely with Orville on U.S.-China policy. Ambassador Lord was at, uh, Henry Kissinger's main uh, aide on the epic game-changing trip to China with President Richard, and Nixon, Richard Nixon in 1972. In addition to becoming President Reagan's ambassador to China, Mr. Lord served as president of the Council on Foreign Relations and assistant secretary of state for East Asian and Pacific Affairs in the, Clinton, sorry, in the Clinton administration. Our conversation today will fo focus on elements of China's rise, China's evolution, its relationships with the United States and the world, and how to understand what has happened with the U.S. and China under the watch of both Orville Schell and Ambassador uh, Lord. Greetings to you both. Thanks so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to talk with you. I'm going to exercise the moderator's personal privilege of saying how much I'm glad to see two of my old friends on this call. Orville Schell, uh, Schell I've known in the journalism world for a long time, and 20 years ago right now, when he was dean of the UC Berkeley Journalism School, I had the honor of being one of his uh, visiting professors for a year, which was a great experience. And Winston Lord, I believe we first met even before I first met Orville Schell, which was back in 1986, when Winston Lord was the U.S. ambassador to China uh, and, and under the, the, the Reagan administration. And I was part of a U.S. delegation to the World Esperanto Federation which is the way I had finagled to get a, a visa to China in those days. We had the, uh, oh, the American delegates were able to come visit the ambassador at his res residence. That was one part of a busy day for an ambassador. It was a big event for the Esperanto uh, Congress. So, um, so, so thank you both for joining us. Um, I'd like to start with you, Orville, with a question about your novel. And also I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to say something that the very first words in your novel, it says, your book is dedicated for my dear wife, Bai Fong, without whom I would never have fully become myself. I'm one of many people on this call who knew, loved, and admired Bai Fong Shell, your beloved wife who, who died recently. I just wanted to acknowledge that as, as a, a prelude to our, our conversation. Unfortunately, tragically, she didn't live quite long enough to see the publication of this, this epic novel. This novel is, in a way, a story of your fully becoming yourself, I would say, through the lens of, of, of what's happening in China. Can you explain to us just briefly why you, a renowned journalist of Chinese affairs, decided to write this wonderful war and peace scale novel about modern China? Well, thanks, Jim. And it's great to be on a, a, a program with you and Winston. And I really look forward to our, our conversation. Um, you know, I think that this this idea of writing fiction, which it actually took me over three decades, because it's no small matter to have that transmigration of the soul from nonfiction to fiction. It really, it really sort of has to bend the metal in some fundamental ways. But I, I felt that the more I I tried to sort of understand why it was so difficult for the U.S. and China to get along, 
the more I realized there were questions that were extremely difficult to address um, in nonfiction. And they, they involved questions that had more to do with sort of interior matters, uh, with, with personal matters, the way people interacted and the way Mao's revolution had, had really affected, and one could even say infected, the ability of human beings to, to, to connect, I mean, for spouses to be together, for lovers to be together, for friends to maintain friendship, uh, all of these different things which bespeak of an interior world. Of course, religion is one of them. Uh, just to be able to think your own thoughts, to write what you want to write, to, to compose music you might want to compose, whatever it is. Um, and so I, I really didn't know how to get to these things. Uh, and I thought, well, since they are kind of ineffable and they are kind of murky, and they, this is what literature is good at, to move from the rational side of our brain, of uh, rational intelligence to sort of more emotional intelligence and try to show through, I mean, you know, China in many ways is a huge success, but it's also an immense tragedy in my view precisely because it hasn't been able to come to terms with some very fundamental human questions. So that's what set me off on this chase. And it was, all, it was a long one. And I, you know, um, well, because it last done and will speak for itself. But I had a, a really interesting and wonderful time uh, using it as a way to probe this other side of, of, of the sort of China conundrum. And um, I, I, Orville and I are good friends, and I'll acknowledge that, but even if we weren't good friends, I'd say this is an outstanding book, and I really hope those who are joining the, the conversation today and your friends will, will read it because it's both, it's, it's wonderful as literature, but also it takes you through, as Orville said, it's some of the, the main episodes of, of modern Chinese history and the interior monologue that is happening there. Winston Lord, I wanted to, to ask you a similar question about, not about novels, but about stories. Um, Orville was saying there are parts of China's development in the time since uh, Mao's rise, which he felt couldn't be addressed in nonfiction or could be best addressed by the storytelling and interior examination of fiction. This brings up the question of the stories with which Americans and Chinese people understand each other, understand that each other as one another as, as human beings, understand one another as, as political entities, you were in a way there from the beginning of the story of US-Chinese relations, you know, dra helping draft there, drafting the Shanghai communique, being there with Kissinger and Nixon and being a central part of the dynamics since then. What do you think the two par main participants, Chinese, the Chinese leadership and the American public or, uh, or its leadership got right and wrong about the stories of each other? Thank you, Jim. Before addressing your question, a couple of comments. First, I join you in my admiration and condolences over the wonderful Bai Fang. Yeah. Secondly, I'm pleased to be with both of you. People always say that. They're not going to say, oh, my God, I'm on this panel with these idiots. But in this case, people not only were friends, but tremendous scholars of China. Jim, who we met the first time, as he said, in a much different China. We can get to that in the late 1980s. And ever since, he's been traveling in China, flying around China, writing articles and a magnificent book. And as for Orville, uh, he's shy about our promoting his book, but I just want to make one quote here. Lu Shun, about whom Orville has just written a wonderful essay, one of the great Chinese writers himself. I'm going to quote Lu Shun on literature. He said, when we read the works of real artists, we not only like and delight in them, but more important, we are moved and affected spiritually. That sums up Orville's book, which is both sweeping and intimate and brings out both distinctive themes and universal themes, which I think is the mark of great literature. So I echo your sales pitch. I say this behind. Orville's back and off screen as well. Now, to get to your question, you said I was there at the beginning. I think you probably know, Jim. I know Orville does that I really was the first one into China. 
We uh, broke off relations, of course, in 1949 when the Chinese communists took over and no American official had been to China until 1971 when Kissinger went on his secret trip to prepare the way for Nixon's trip. Of course, most people think Kissinger was therefore the first official in China, but even he admits that I got there before him because as we went on this trip in a Pakistani airplane from Islamabad to Beijing, as the plane got close to the Chinese airspace, I went to the front of the plane, I left Henry in the back, and so I was the first American official going into China. <clears throat> now, uh, we've gotten lots of things right and wrong, and of course we're talking now about several decades. I'm not sure which one you want to uh, get, but let me talk about what we got right at the very beginning, and then we can uh, go on in later decades, if you will. We had been separated from China for 22 years, mutual hostility and isolation. We fought them in Korea. Uh, and both of us, the Chinese and Americans, had very complex landscapes domestically. The Chinese were isolated from the world, were still in the throes of the Cultural Revolution in the late 60s, early 70s. We had a Vietnam War going on for many years, domestic riots, political assassinations and an American diplomacy, which was somewhat hamstrung by all these factors. So each side managed to see beyond this, how we could get together. I don't want to get into great detail because we don't have time, but essentially we wanted to move toward China to talk to a quarter of the world's people to make sure that this Moscow was not the only spokesman for the communist world, uh, that we could get help in ending the Vietnam War that above all, we could improve relations with the Soviet Union. We could demonstrate to the world we could still have diplomatic flexibility during this period, and we could lift the morale of the American people who were sagging under the weight of Vietnam. China had two major incentives to open up with us. One, they wanted to balance off the threat to the North, the Soviets, which was threatening them at that point. And secondly, they wanted to get out of the isolation. They had only one ambassador abroad at the time. To cut this answer short, both sides achieved its objectives by kicking down the road the Taiwan issue and the insuperable obstacles, by making clear in the Shanghai communique we had differences, but moving ahead where we had common objectives, like I mentioned. And to end up, it was a classical, as the Chinese like to say, win-win situation. We immediately proved relations with the Soviets, had a summit meeting, arms control, Berlin Agreement, uh, we got help in the Vietnam War. We showed the world we could act decisively and we lifted the morale of the American people. The Chinese uh, got insurance against the Soviets and they also got into the United Nations and normalized relations with many countries and got out of their isolation. So far-sighted and I say courageous leaders on both sides could see where the common interest was and we had a very successful launch. You know, you were there from the beginning, and thank you for so admirably summing up, you know, these decades of experience in, in, a, in a concise way. And let me turn back to, to Orville again. As Winston Lord very accurately and astutely pointed out, your novel, like all wonderful literature, is a combination of the specific and the universal. And it's very deeply rooted in China. You, you uh, constantly use the, the Chinese character equivalents of Chinese phrases you're using. It's said in uh, Beijing and in Shanghai and all, all over the, the country. So it's very, very uh, deeply rooted in China, but it also is about, it's set in the United States. And one of its central themes is in fact, universality that your one of your main characters is of, uh, you know, uh, combined American and Chinese parentage. Uh, music and the universality of music is a major theme in, in, in your book. This is a long way of setting up the, the following question. One of the big themes in the eras and the decades of U.S. Chinese interactions that Winston Lord was describing that you, Orville Schell, have chronicled and that you're describing in your book is the, the yearning for international values among Chinese people. Uh, values of being part of world culture, of, of Western music, international music, of having the small ill liberal values, which the Western world believes are, are indeed universal. Over the last 40 years, it has seemed that you, the China's relations with the world have gone 
up and down, but within a band that was steadily becoming more internationalized, more universalized, if you will, for, for China. Do you think that band now changed? Now, if you, you've written a novel about sort of the, the universal and the Chinese, and should we read your account as basically a tragic one or basically a hopeful one in the long term? Um, I mean, I, I, as I say, I think there's a great element amidst all the success of what China has done of, of, of tragedy. I, I think, um, you know, the thing we learn about Chinese history is that it is utterly unpredictable and that there's all sorts of different potentialities within it. And it does keep changing in the most surprising way. To do that. Uh, you know, when I went to China in 1975 um, to work there for, for several months, um, it seemed like that was China. Mao was alive, you know, the Cultural Revolution was going on. And it seemed uh, kind of eternal, just as long ago dynastic China seemed eternal. But then it suddenly changed and Deng Xiaoping came along. And, and that was sort of the, the, the second act of what Winston and Henry Kissinger had set up. It was the beginning of engagement, really. And during that amazing period in the 80s, when Winston was ambassador towards the latter part, I mean, it was completely possible to believe that China might ultimately become more convergent with the world outside. And, um, you know, I was very hopeful and an incredibly exciting time. And almost anything seemed possible then. And there were elections, things were being translated. The media was relatively open. People could say things in public. And then what happened? 1989, and things closed down. But then they opened up again under Jiang Zemin. And we look back on that period now and we see it is quite open. And now, and this is one reason I wanted to sort of write this book. It's out of a recognition of that it's really hard to escape history. And memory is really important because it sticks with you. So what's happened now? You, you, you mentioned what kind of bandwidth is there now? Uh, what, what are the prospects of change? Well, I think what we see is, remember when Deng Xiaoping came along and he kind of waved his wand? And... And there were these startling reforms and people were opening up. There was one British diplomat wrote a book called Coming Alive. Um, well, in fact, that's what was happening. And yet uh, it was very naive of us to assume that all of those years of Mao Zedong, whether it's the Cultural Revolution or just the Maoist Revolution, could be waved away, washed clean, and China would start again in this new and improved opening to, uh, to the outside world. And what we see now, I think, is a certain sense of kind of a revenge of history, of how deeply that revolution became implanted in the sort of, if you will, the genetic makeup of China. And now Xi Jinping is sort of bringing elements of it back again. I mean, that's what he cut his teeth on. That's what he learned. That's what he knows. And when he confronts the problem, he reaches into his toolbox, which was formed in the Cultural Revolution, and he takes out the tools he has, and largely they're tools of control. They're Leninist tools. So I think you know, there is a kind of a waxing and waning on them. I don't think we should be too despairing of China because within it, there is a kind of an incipient opposite that I think will someday reappear. And we've seen it uh, in the past over and over and over and some wonderful writing and films and music. And, and so, I mean, finally, I guess I would just say what, what, what astounds me about Xi Jinping and where we are now is this. After so much success and after having so many things to which the Chinese people should be rightfully, recklessly proud of accomplishing, which is extraordinary what they've done. Why are they putting it all at risk with such foolish policies around the world? They're alienating the world toward what end? As far as I can see, no good end. And why are they doing it? What's going on here? And this is another 
question that I was trying to answer through fiction. You know, what is that complex relationship with the outside world that has to prove you're strong, you're powerful, you can be a bully, you can throw your weight around, you can, you know, um, it's not something that's easy to factor into a foreign policy statement or a, or, or a piece of nonfiction. So Winston, Lord, I'm going to ask you to respond to that, but I just have a quick follow-up for Orville. As Americans, we like to console ourselves with the idea that the arc of history is long, but it bends towards justice. For China, are you saying the arc of history is very long, and but it bends towards what? Well, <laughs> I think we will all show our indelibly Western and, and in our case, sort of white Anglo-Saxon Protestant roots. Uh, I mean, I do in some way believe if the arc of history doesn't bend towards justice, I wish it did. And I will do everything I can to help it bend in that direction. In China's direction, I suspect it probably will because there are certain inescapable human qualities that I think really do like insofar as they can to be as free as they can. This is just an impulse. But on the other hand, I'm aware China lived a long time under dynastic, it's kind of a, an authoritarian dynasticism. So I really don't know whether China is the exception, but I think um, it's certainly not clear that the Chinese Communist Party's version of governance now is the success story of the century and will last for all time and is going to defy our kinds of notions that history does have a sort of a direction. So, so Winston, I'll ask you to both say the arc of history bends towards X when it comes to China and also how you think we should understand <clears throat> Xi Jinping and his time? What, what has surprised you? Uh, what, what is not surprising to you? And how, what we should think about you know, the, the future role he's going to have in China or how what China will continue to be like under him? I'm desperate to keep my answers short, but you're making it tough. Uh, <laughs> before answering that question, let me make a couple of comments on what Orville said. First, I agree about predictions in China. Uh, with the exception of my two colleagues here, I think Chinese, quote, expert is an oxymoron or just a plain moron. It's just too complex and too uh, murky to figure out what's going on. But I'll just echo uh, Orville's, without being naive, uh, a feeling over the long arc in terms of basic human instincts, what you need over the long run for economic uh, help and for stability, the examples of other countries in Asia and elsewhere, I'm not yet ready to call this a finished uh, product. Again, to look at, he meant, you mentioned this terrific opening in the late 80s. I do want to comment on that because I was there at the time. And not only were you there, but Orvo and Bifong were there as well. Yeah. Uh, it was extraordinary. You can see why we got hopes up. You had, of course, two fairly, quote, liberal general secretaries in Zhao Ziyang and Hu Yabang. Uh, there was a lot of talk of political reform. My wife, who I considered a co-ambassador in terms of her cultural and political and other outreach, uh, we used to host salons at the embassy, which Orville knows about, in which we would have dissidents and reformers and government and party officials sitting around the same table talking about political reform. Now imagine that uh, today. I was the first ambassador to go to Tibet. Uh, so it was an incredible period and we did get our hopes up. There were two very interesting warning signals about how the trajectory is going to change because we left the week of the first demonstrations at Tiananmen Square, Hu Yabang's future funeral in early April, when the first time 100,000 people turned out. But the three or four years before that were open. But I got two warning signals. One in 1988, June, one year before Tiananmen, Betty and I were invited out to Beijing University to a place called Democracy Salon, where they had hundreds of students listening to speakers. Uh, after we spoke there, we were careful what we said. Deng Xiaoping sent an envoy to me two days later and warned me not to go out and speak to students without his permission. So that began to say, wait a second, things are getting a little uneasy here. 
The second one, I won't go into detail, but when President Bush came in February 1989, I invited a dissident, Fang Lejeur, who is written about in Orville's book, to attend a banquet to show our symbolism for human rights without being overly provocative. And a Chinese wrecked the, the banquet. Uh, so again, we saw the warning signals even before we left. Now, I haven't gotten to your question. I probably can't do it justice because I don't want to take up too much time. Uh, she has been more dangerous and more aggressive than I would have predicted and many people predicted. I remember right after now President Biden had spent 10 days with Xi when he was vice president uh, many years ago. And I talked to the top State Department and the top NSC official who were with Biden with 10 days with Xi. One of them said, this is guy's going to be a reformer. It's somebody we can really work with. He'll be tough, but this is, a, this is going to be a constructive exchange, I think. The second person I talked to was on every single same meeting said, this guy's really dangerous. Mm. We're in for a rocky road here. So again, it shows you the complexity. But he has been, none of us are naive, but he has taken China since 2012. There were already signals. I mean, Hu Yabang, I mean, uh, Hu Jintao before him was fooling around the South China Sea, and it was always repressive. But his crackdown at home, interfering in other countries, aggression to this overseas, uh, has been at an extreme, is, is almost, almost puzzling in terms of the self-interest. Now, you ask what he's out, out for. I think it's pretty clear, and i got to cut this short. Uh, he's out, as he stated it very clearly, in many anniversaries coming up and many pronouncements, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, but in simple terms, for China to become the Middle Kingdom again. Maybe not in his lifetime, but certainly in his now unfettered tenure, uh, the dominant power in Asia and uh, co-equal on the world stage. That doesn't mean we have to have conflict or war. We should try to get along with smart competition. But we do face a tremendous challenge. And I think she is the most uh, dangerous and aggressive Chinese leader we've seen since Mao. That is a, a, a weighty um, statement. I, I, I want to say something about your your um, line I entirely agree with about China experts being a, 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 you know, self-contradictory. I, I did a piece one time about somebody who'd been at the center of the outsourcing business in southern China for 15 years, an Irishman named Liam Casey. He said in the 15 years he'd been in China, every single day he knew half as much about China as the day before. <laughs> Because he just, you know, was exposed to how much he, he would, would would never understand. Um, many of you all are sending in excellent questions, which I'll get to in, in a couple of minutes. I have a few more questions for um, Orville Shell and, and Winston Lord. Um, Orville, let, let me ask you: If people in the outside, in the world outside of China, in the United States, in North America, in Europe, or wherever else, are concerned about developments within China? and between the China of Xi Jinping and the rest of the world, what is the most effective thing they could or should do? Should they foster exchange programs? Should they foster boycotts? Should they agitate with their governments? If people shared your understanding of what's good and troubling in China right now, what would you have them do? Well, I, my prescription <clears throat> is one which, alas, I'm not sure is really workable. And, and, and after I tell you the prescription, I will tell you why I think it's probably going to be very difficult sledding. I, I do think China is uh, a, a real threat, uh, not just an economic threat, but if you look at the way the military buildup in China and in the United States now to counter it, uh, is, is going and the flashpoints that exist on the South China Sea, particularly the Taiwan Straits, but also the East China Sea with Japan. And Japan is no military, uh, you know, weakling. Um, you really have to be concerned. And I recently had a, 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 a talk with uh, the former uh, commander of the Pacific Fleet who just couldn't stop talking about how alarmed he is at how dangerous he, he thinks the situation is out there and how little communication we have with China. So if something erupted, how would we control it? 
someone shoots a missile, someone, you know, sinks a ship, then what? Then we're off to the races. So I, I'm really, really worried uh, uh, about that that kind of situation. In fact, now, Jim, I got so worried, I forgot your question. But <laughs> the question is, is so for members of the public or for university deans, as you, you used to be, or for think tank people, as, as, as you are now, what what if people understand China the way you think is the correct understanding? What should they do? So I think having sort of set up this rather dire uh, uh, description of, of the circumstance we live in, I think it's really important that we prepare for uh, the worst, but that we don't presume it. We don't encourage it. We don't hope for it. And at the same time, wherever possible, we do seek to sort of build musculature between the two countries. Now, I said at the outset that I'm a little pessimistic about this scenario. I think that, 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 that China does not have a very good uh, history of late. This is not true back when Winston was ambassador and when he was working with Henry Kissinger. But of, on the one hand, uh, engaging in adversarial kinds of competition sometimes, but on the other hand, also recognizing there are some, there is some common interest. The trouble is now that, that Xi Jinping's sort of modus operandi is too often to use one thing as a hostage against another thing. So it might use working on climate change as a hostage against some other kind of trade negotiation or, or, or something else. So I think that is the real challenge and it's gonna take more than diplomacy and finally, I would say the reason why it's so difficult is the reason of reasons. It is the most important question we confront. But how do we understand it? Why is China unable to do that? And I think here we get back into history. We get back into the whole culture of humiliation and victimization and, and the imbalance of power, the, the sense of China having lost its place in the world and now on the precipice of regaining it, a very complicated sort of psychological syndrome, which again, is not easy to factor into policymaking. So that's a perfect segue to the question I wanted to ask um, Winston Lord, which is, is again, you've been at the center of US policy making towards China through the time of, of, of modern relations. And if I was asking Orville what he thought uh, the public should, members of the public should do and university leaders, what do you think governments should do if you were in control of US government policy towards China right now, what would be the balance between engagement of um, disengagement, et cetera? What, what should governments in the Western world do? Well, I would use as my blueprint task force report put out by Orville Schell and Susan Shirt, uh, which is being followed almost to the letter, I might say, by the Biden administration so far. Essentially as follows. We ought to treat this as a Sputnik moment to get our own act together. Focus on our running faster than just slowing China down. And being confident if we get our act together that we have tremendous relative assets versus China, which after all has huge problems and is not 10 feet tall. So it's a serious problem. The general outlines are oval spelled out. Let me be a little more uh, specific. Uh, the one thing Trump got right was to call this a strategic competition. That's what it is. And he took a few steps showing up to Taiwan on a Officially, more patrols in the South China Sea, some selective economic moves, uh, et cetera, uh, that were useful. But on the whole, the Trump administration reacted with machetes rather than scalpels. We need Chinese scientists. We need Chinese students. We need Chinese investment. So you don't throw all of those out. You find out where your security problems are, wall them off. But to get to your point, continue to promote exchanges which do not touch on security as being in our interest. Uh, the relationship is going to be uh, a mixture of competition, where, as I say, we can do it smartly and selectively, being firm where we have to and cooperate where we can. Uh, and there's going to have to have talks to make sure we don't fall into a Cold War conflict through military uh, mismanagement. But I'd say the most essential thing about China policy, and I think the Biden administration is getting this right, and the Trump administration didn't, and I am bipartisan, 
is that you have to build on three pillars to have an effective China policy, maybe foreign policy in general. First, get your act together at home, both soft power to show we're a functioning democracy, rule of law, human rights, and a model for the world rather than a hypocritical, and hard power, investing, whether it's infrastructure or science and technology, education, so we can compete with China. The second pillar is our allies. You work with them rather than picking trade fights or the expensive bases to be paid. And the Biden administration has already moved on the first pillar on the pandemic and its relief package. And on the second one with the allies, uh, we're settling on bases, we're toning down the trade, but above all, we're consulting. As we speak, secretaries of state and defense uh, visiting Japan and Seoul are allies first. Uh, then they will sit down with the Chinese. We've already had Biden leading a quad discussion with Australia, India, and Japan. So we're getting our allies more together with us. There's going to be differences, but it gives us greater leverage to have a united front rather than picking fights with them and having a divided front. And the third pillar is international institutions rejoining them and showing leadership rather than leaving the field to China, whether it's the WHO, which has made mistakes, and pandemics or climate control, nonproliferation, WTO. We can work with friends and allies, and it's the one area where we still have common interests with China and can cooperate with them. So it's gonna be a mixed picture. It's a serious long-term strategic competition. Above all, let's get our act together Let's feel self-confident uh, and let's distinguish between what is dangerous and what is still workable. Thank you for that. And I agree with you in endorsing the, the, the task force report that, uh, that Orville and Susan Shirk and others were involved in. I thought it's very clear headed and you summed it up very well. I'm going to ask you one policy follow up before ever turning to, to Orville for a question, then questions from, from our, our audience. So what would be the most concise way you could boil down U.S. policy on the three extremely problematic areas of Hong Kong, Xinjiang, and Taiwan. Now, I recognize that's a month-long answer on each of them, but what would be sort of the, the commanding height summary on those three very problematic areas? You did mean that question for all, didn't you? Not me. <laughs> okay. It's, it's got Hong your name Kong, on it. Let's face it. The first, you've got to begin with the very sad fact that given Xi's instincts and policies and his goals were stability and control, uh, Trump's everything, excuse the pun, uh, we're not going to have easy answers to any one of those three. Uh, was, you, you had the verbal which we've already done about addressing the squashing of rights in Hong Kong, which is becoming another Chinese city, of uh, the massacres and the other depredations in Xinjiang. And uh, Taiwan concern about increasing Chinese pressures. Let me take Taiwan first, and I'll try to be quick. Uh, we certainly shouldn't change our one China policy, which is appropriately murky and ambiguous which manages, has worked for several decades and shouldn't be changed, be overly provocative, but we should increase our support for Taiwan, whether it's high level visits, continued arms sales, trying to get them in international institutions, a free trade agreement uh, in ways which bolster them, work quietly on defensive measures, make sure Taiwan spends its money where it should for defensive purposes, uh, maintain our credibility in the Pacific with our allies and, and with our presence. Uh, and that's the best way to deter the Chinese and to try to protect. I think, to, I, I'm not worried about an invasion, but there are things short of that which are troublesome, but that's what we can do in Taiwan, strengthen them as best we can and strengthen our reputation and credibility for deterrence purposes against China. On the, on the Uyghur question, uh, I do think, boycott and sanctions on trade coming from Xinjiang, which has overwhelming share of the world's cotton trade, for example. It does hurt the Chinese economically to do that, as well as speaking out. It's not going to change their policy, but the best thing you can do is at least make them pay a price. And Hong Kong, I just despair. I mean, in addition to 
speaking out and getting the British above all with their responsibilities to work, try to get other countries to speak out. Uh, that's all we can do. I, I hate to be so pessimistic and maybe Ogo can rescue me here, but I'm afraid Hong Kong is just going to look like Shanghai or Guangzhou uh, very soon. Um, very, very nimbly handled to you know, cover major areas in U.S.-China policy in, in a, a concise and, and clear way. Um, Orville, I'm going to um, ask you a cultural question. I'll spare you um, the Hong Kong, Taiwan, Xinjiang question. And these are things which go through a couple of the questions that have come up in the chat. One of them uh, says, when I came to this country 30 years ago, young people in China admired American democracy. I'm not sure this is so true in China now. What do you think when she said East is up, West is down? Similarly, there's another question about whether people in China are aware of some of the upsurge in anti-Asian violence that's happening in the U.S. This general question of, of the emotional bonds between people within China and the outside world, including the United States, what is this... Um, where do you think the balance stands in sort of the admiration, feeling hurt, um, admiring the Western world or not admiring the Western world? Th those, those eternal questions at this moment. Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, uh, we do have to be incredibly mindful of, the, uh, of our long history of, uh, of uh, race in this country towards uh, Asians in general and Chinese in specific. I mean, this is a, a problem which we were well aware of. And particularly if China becomes more adversarial and, and should we even have a, some kind of clash with them? Uh, I mean, we remember what happened to the Japanese in World War II. So I think it's, it's incredibly important that we don't identify the, the Chinese Americans who are living here and even some Chinese who are living here necessarily with the Chinese Communist Party. And that is something to be ever mindful of. I do think also, Jim, you know, you're absolutely right that 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 um, that sort of idealistic notion of the U.S. as the city on the hill in terms of democracy has taken a beating. But you know, I look at these questions not just as an American, which I can't avoid doing, but I look at the question of these sort of fundamental rights, which I do believe are or should be universal, as not American but is universal and worthy of support, regardless of what happens to American democracy. Uh, I do hope American democracy survives, and I do hope it will be as, as vigorous as it can be. So I think it's made it harder in the kind of the horse race with China, if you will, over systems, that our system has had such a, a, a compromised patch, if you will. But it doesn't mean that I feel any less convicted of the importance of these kinds of things like liberty, freedom, rights, justice. I mean, th these are important. And as a human being, not just as an American. So, um, Orville, there's a question, another question in that's come in from the audience, which um, given that you are in Northern California in the Bay Area at the moment, I will th throw this first to you, but I'll see if Winston wants to weigh in too. It's about the realm of artificial intelligence. This is something I've been in for a long time, and there's a whole school of thought that this is a particularly concerning aspect of U.S. Chinese tech evolution in that, for example, the Chinese government now is able to match a face from one of the ubiquitous cameras on uh, Chinese street, uh, street scenes with, with a, a real name and an ID number in, in less than a second or so. How concerning to you is AI as a particular item on the US Chinese agenda, or is this just, just another item as far as you're concerned? No, I think it's incredibly important. The whole field of technology actually, in my view, is how the U.S.-China relationship is going to turn. It will turn uh, in a significant way on the technology question. And, and there are many pieces of that from, you know, 5G, from new five nanometer chips and who gets the chips, who gets the fabs, who gets the, does the research. Uh, AI, I think, is one element that's extremely important in all of this. And what, what our increasingly adversarial and competitive relationship with China, of course, uh, challenges is the whole notion of a global commons of scientific research. Because if in fact we end up being competitors, okay, 
maybe we can survive that. But how about adversaries? How about at war? Well, then suddenly the question of who owns AI becomes a question of national interest, not a, a global commons question. And then you start having to say, my goodness, uh, all the Chinese students in, in American labs, what happens to them? I had the former chancellor of Berkeley stop me in, in the uh, faculty club not long ago. And he'd been reading all my writing and he said, you know, he, he wanted to remind me that every single student in his physics labs, every pre, you know, postdoc, he said was Chinese. So how do we decouple that? Well, that is going to be a monstrous problem because we're so used to thinking of things like the field of AI research as being something that the whole world is, contributes to, not as sort of national competitors with labs that are only filled with Americans. It's not the case. And uh, that's like we're resecting something surgically that is very, very involved. And I don't know how you decouple that, but it, we certainly need to start thinking about it in case something happens. So Winston, I have an extension of that, that question to you as a policy matter. As the U.S. balances the necessity of dealing with, with scientists from around the world, whether it's uh, in advanced information technology or coping with a pandemic, and of course, climate change, with all the security concerns that are involved in each of these aspects, how should the U.S. set policy about, um, about having uh, international students in research labs? Uh, should it be more open, less open? What's the policy guidance here? Well, there clearly are some security concerns. Some students, uh, some pressures on those students, some scientists, uh, and so on. And I'm not in any way trying to downplay that, but I'm in favor of as much openness as possible in our own self-interest for the reasons Orville mentioned. And so we need the scientists, we need investment in certain areas, we need students here. It's a great asset for us. Yes, be careful about security and wall off those particular problems, but let's not overreact, both in terms of anti-Asian hysteria, but more significantly, perhaps, in, in concrete terms, what it means for our national uh, interest. So we should be investing more, and here we're going to have to have government help, not to pick and choose specific companies, but to help general industries in many areas, in, in addition to robots and artificial intelligence big data and you know, biological science, as Orville says, it's gonna be crucial in our competition. So as much openness as possible with renewed concern about security dimensions, but investment by ourselves and then working closely with like-minded nations, whether it's on 5G technology, whatever it is, to make sure that not only we, but those who whom we share values and national interests can make sure that we're not overly dependent or out-competed by the Chinese. Uh, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn this next question again to you. Let's start with you, Winston, on this one. Um, a member of the audience asked, what kind of competition is there to Xi inside the CCP? Are there no rivals of any power who might want to shift the equation? What should we understand about internal politics within the Communist Party? Well, Anybody gives you a clear answer to that question gets back to the Chinese expert being a moron. The quick answer, and then of course I won't leave it at that, is I don't have the slightest idea. But my more nuanced answer is I can't see any real proof there's significant opposition to him, not only in terms of the way he's cleaned out his opponents, the surveillance systems, the crackdown, the education in the schools, the propaganda, the censorship, the police force, uh, but also, he's very popular in many areas. They have made, as Orville said, so much advancement in recent decades. They deserve credit for that. And it is sad is that they've had this darker side, particularly under Xi. So I think the odds are certainly against anything near-term uh, threatening Xi. Uh, he does have some problems. We overlook. We, you know, we thought Japan was going to eat our lunch in the late 80s. We thought the Soviets were going to beat us in the Cold War. China's got real problems. I don't have time to go into them, but whether it's inequality, debt, pollution, uh, corruption, demographics, uh, you name it, uh, they, they have a real problem. Uh, and 
it's possible if the economy starts faltering and they have a tremendous debt problem, then, of course, he could get into some trouble. But it, we've counted the Chinese econ uh, economy out so many times, I can't see it. So th the last point I would make is, if there is going to be a change in China, given the repression system, it's going to have to come from a split leadership, in my view, not some uprising, which you can't really sustain in that society. But I don't see that happening uh, in the next decade or two, and I could be wrong tomorrow. Um, Orville, for you, a different topic, unless you have anything you'd like to add about internal politics in the party, which is the pandemic, uh, which has you know, just uh, devastated the world in, in the past year. What have we learned about China and China's relationship with the world from the course of this pandemic? And what can the U.S. do with China to prepare for a less disastrous outcome next time? Well, you would think, wouldn't you, that such a thing as a pandemic would be the perfect area uh, for collaboration, just to put the other uh, more divisive issues aside, as is, would climate change be? It remains to be seen. And yet, um, I mean, uh, you can blame China for starting it, sure, but it has started and now we have to deal with it. And pandemics always start someplace and through some malfeasance or other, they get growing. But that doesn't do us any good to pin blame. So I think that um, we have to see if it is actually going to be possible under Biden. And I think Winston's right. Biden's on the right track. He's trying to do uh, things, two different sort of um, uh of areas of, of, of approach to China. One is to arch his back and push back and say no, and the other is to work together. And we'll see if, if, if the latter is, is actually possible. Um, you know, as to the question which you asked Winston, maybe it's just, just a quick thought. You know, again, when I was in China the, for the first time uh, in 1975, I did not see one single scintilla of any kind of evidence whatsoever that that society had within it the capacity to change, to turn. And yet, within, well, within five years, there had been a radical change. And I think what we learn about China is that its long authoritarian history in, in the dynastic period has dovetailed very nicely with its Leninist period, but that that means that you don't always see manifestations of how people are actually thinking and feeling and, and they're, they're used to, to biding their time because there's no alternative. So I think it's not unthinkable that we could at some point in the near future, not maybe more distant future, we could see something like what happened in the late 70s and the 1980s all over again. And I fully believe, and I know a lot of these people, and I know you two do too, that there are a lot of people that would welcome it. But those people are mute because the state controls the, 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 the means of communicating uh, information. And so it looks as if it's gone to sleep, but it may be only in a state of kind of th those people recognize this isn't the time unless they want to get squashed. And then there are a few who, 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 who make that, that uh, take that gamble uh, to stand up and be counted. So I would just say that the thing about China, it's the most least resolved country in the world in the sense that People don't really agree on anything, finally. There, there's a lot of a lack of resolution. And when one side gets expressed, one whole host of, of, of issues and, and, and character traits for the national character traits come out. But when the other side gets expressed, it seems like it's on, on the complete opposite side. So stay tuned. So a follow-up, which again is a whole enormous question, but but just to give us your sort of distilled views for, for you, Orville, you've been extremely active in U.S.-Chinese cooperation on climate affairs. What is your optimism, pessimism barometer on the U.S.-Chinese aspect of that uh, crucial dynamic now? I think um, we don't know yet. 
Um, we're actually going to do a, a very big climate change exhibit and kind of uh, jamboree in a year's time when the Kennedy Center in Washington has its 50th anniversary and do a whole show on the melting glaciers of the Himalayas and, and, and you know, cultural performances and whatnot, because I think it is so important that the U.S. and China do find ways to come together on this. Biden is 100 percent committed to this. That's why he appointed John Kerry, who's a cabinet level position within the government. Can he find a, a counterpart of sufficient standing in China? Will the Chinese Communist Party allow uh, parts of the Chinese uh, government to collaborate openly with the United States and globally on this question? We don't know yet. But that's going to be a critical question because not only will it determine the fate of, what, of how we resolve the climate problem, but it also could temper the US-China relationship in a very constructive and positive way by giving us something we're doing together that really matters. So I think, um, I, I think this is of great importance and I, I hope that for any Chinese government officials listening to this conversation, they will recognize this is the way to do two things at once, solve the climate problem and to try to lower the temperature on the U.S.-China relationship, which is utterly critical. So, so Winston, I, I will assume that you agree with, with, uh, with Orville on the climate issue. Let me ask you another enormous question that's come in in the, uh, the audience questions, which is about North Korea. How should a U.S. audience understand China's relationship with North Korea and how that affects the, the prospects on the peninsula? Just one comment on climate. I agree with what Orville said. The one thing that we cannot do, and I don't think the Biden administration will do, is to trade off other issues for Chinese cooperation on climate. To say, well, we'll let up on you in economic if you help us on the climate. That's the wrong approach. We're not going to take it because climate change is in China's interest, it's self-interest. They're not just doing us a favor if they work on this problem. So it should be a high priority. It's an area we can cooperate, but we shouldn't trade off other concessions for China ought to be doing it in its own self-interest as well as cooperation uh, uh, with us. Now your question again? On, on North Korea. What's, yeah, what's North Korea. The, 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 the bumper North, sticker it's version. It's easy to forget North, North Korea. Korea. It's easy to forget North Korea. Uh, what you got to understand about China and North Korea, we should talk to them as we're already talking to Japan and South Korea. It's, we've got to review the policy and collectively involve all these countries. But let's keep in mind, even though China doesn't want North Korea to get bigger nu nuclear options, it above all prizes its stability in having a North Korean regime not being overthrown or having problems on the border. So they're never going to put the kind of pressure on North Korea that we would like. They've always undercut sanctions. On the whole, in this, year, this issue, China has been more of a problem than a solution. So I'm not optimistic, but we should consult it. They've got legitimate concerns. Uh, I think the best we can do, and I'll cut this short, is see whether we can freeze things where they are. Uh, there's no way to get North Korea to denuclearize in the short run indicate to China that we understand they have security concerns. Uh, and if there ever was a change there that we would help with refugees, we would make sure nuclear weapons are under UN control, we wouldn't move US troops further north. Uh, so we can indicate at some realization they have genuine concerns, we should consult and above all with our allies. But I don't see any near term prospect on great progress in this issue, perhaps trying to get a freeze for a reasonable price. And I don't think it's a major area of cooperation with China because they have different priorities than we do. So, once more, I'm going to ask you one more question, and I think I'll, I'll be turning to, to Orville for the final one. Question, you know, Orville and I both make our living as, or have as, as, as journalists. Journalism about China is a particularly fraught situation right now. What should the U.S. government do in response to the increasing constraints within China on reporting about the country of China? Well, I frankly approve of what the Trump administration did to sort of respond to what the Chinese were doing to our journalists. It's a shame. We ought to know what's going on there. 
but the Chinese are so paranoid uh, and so repressive and uh, censor oriented that they've made it impossible to do work there. Now, of course, major organizations aren't there. I would see quietly, even though I'm pessimistic, whether we can somehow restore, maybe lift some of our recent actions against the Chinese journalists, if they will genuinely make it easier to have access and permanent presence and transparency in China. So I would explore this, it's important, but I'm pessimistic. And, and, and Orville, I'm going to turn this question to you before a, a final one in your role as former dean of a journalism school and, and uh, how what should aspiring American reporters or uh, people who now are influential in the U.S. press do in response to these uh, Chinese constraints? You know, I think actually uh, this is an area where uh, the two countries actually have a prospect of coming to some new modus operandi. Um, I mean, if we want to practice at working out problems, I think this is a good one to start with, the question of visas. Who gets visas to go to which country? And what is a reciprocal relationship that would satisfy both sides? I mean, we worked something like this out with the Soviet Union during the Cold War. We had a kind of a balance. You know, we get so many, they get so many. You kick out one, we kick out one. Uh, but in China, it started to unravel because fundamentally, as Winston notes, the, the Chinese Communist Party is hostile to the notion of having foreigners roaming around showing the, the, the underbelly of their, their system. But I think they recognize the need for it, the need to do business and particularly for business reporting. And if I was the Biden administration, I would put this on the list of one of the practical things that might be able to be worked out with a new framework and to stabilize it and to use that as an example of how to, uh, to, to discuss in a concrete way and stabilize other areas where we have disagreements and things are out of balance and in a state of disarray. So we've reached the point in our program where there's time for only one last question, but I'm gonna use my prerogative to ask it actually of each of our uh, esteemed guests just for a, you know, as for a minute or so from each of you, I'll start, actually, I'll start with you, Winston. You've spent decades and decades of your life at the center of US-China relations. What is the main thing you wish the average American understood about China? I think uh, it's complexity uh, that, as Orville said, we don't draw permanent uh, conclusions about the near term, that we're going to need patience, that things look very grim now, both within China and our relationship. It's the worst it's been since the 70s, uh, but that we should exhibit kind of self-confidence and our ability to compete keeping this a peaceful competition, although a tense one. And so I, I think Americans should not drift to either extreme. One extreme is not really possible right now, and that is to be naively optimistic and to be a, what they call the panda huggers and be overly, to think it's all the Americans' fault, what's happening. Uh, that's wrong. It's mostly China's fault, although we've made some mistakes. The other extreme is to give up and to drift toward a Cold War or something worse, and to consider them an enemy. They're dangerous, they're a strategic adversary, they're areas of competition and coercion, but also possible cooperation. So patience, don't give up, don't give in. So Orville, you can close us out in our final minute here, which is the main thing you wish people who are not quote China experts understood beyond reading your excellent book. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Um, I think first thing is to recognize, you know, the, the extraordinary progress that China has actually made. And it has been under the Chinese Communist Party. But the second thing is to recognize that the Chinese Communist Party has an incomplete uh, rejuvenation. And it is uh, going to bring itself down if it cannot allow its people to live 
more equitably, more openly, more tolerantly, and in a system where there's some actual justice, I would say those things are really important to know. And it's, it's, a, it's the two, two sides of the same coin, and it's the opposite. Uh, they're opposites. And we may see the other side of the coin express itself in time to come, but not yet. But now, Jim, before we end, I want to ask you the same question. Oh, Orville, that's not fair. Um, <laughs> Maybe not, but speak. I think it would be the, the poor man's distillation of what you both said, which is recognizing the, that, that everything is, you could say about China is simultaneously true and finding some way to deal with the success and the heartbreak and the, the, the openness and the increasing closedness. And that is something Americans have a really, people have a hard time doing that in general. Americans have a really hard time doing that in foreign policy. It's hard to take other countries seriously without classifying them as an enemy. So that, that is, that is the, that, that's my, my amateur version. Of you know, Jim, Mao Zedong loved and wrote essays on contradictions, right? And I think that is the proper way to understand China as a contradiction that can go in, and has gone in, in uh, either direction at different times. And that's the way we have to try to, to, try to view it. So this conversation could go on for days and days. I hope I'll have the chance to pursue it in real life with my friends Orville Shell and Winston Lord. But um, I, I express thanks to all of you who've joined this conversation, uh, to the, the Commonwealth Club, and we hope to continue this. And please be sure, among other, your other readings, to, uh, to get my old home. Thanks to our viewers. Thanks to Orville Shell and Winston Lord. And we'll see you all sometime soon. Thanks, Jim. Thank you.